Aloha, welcome back once again. This is Jim with Through Jim's Eyes, where today I'm speaking to owner, operator, farmer, and the Javananda, <laughs> Dave Steiner, owner of Javaloha uh, Coffee and the best cup of coffee that I have ever had. Today we're discussing the series. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Today we are discussing the uh, grinding of the coffee beans and why it is important to only purchase whole beans, not grounds. And we're looking at some of the different styles for brewing. And I'm just going to say, Dave, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Um, yeah, like you said, it is really critical that you buy whole bean coffee. And the reason for that is that beans are basically little oily ball bearings. If that's how you can think of a coffee bean. So you want to use those coffee beans as fresh as possible before those oils go rancid. Once you grind up your coffee beans, however you're going to use them, you've just exponentially increased the surface area that that oil is now exposed to the air. And they're going to go rancid a lot faster. So you're not going to have that fresh cup. If you want to have the ideal cup of coffee, Buy your beans as freshly roasted as possible. Grind them right before you're going to use them. Today, we're going to talk about a couple of different brewing methods and show why there are different grinds that are appropriate for every brewing method. You can't use just a universal grind for each brewing method because it simply doesn't work. You're not going to get the best cup of coffee in each case. There's a, a different tool for every job. There's a different grind for every brew. Um, here in front of us on the table, I've got Turkish ground coffee, espresso ground coffee, coffee for cone-shaped filters, which are the Melita filters, or the um, uh, a lot of the coffee makers make ones with a, a gold leaf over them now. The grounds for a basket-shaped filter, like a Mr. Coffee in a bun. Um, this is the slightly more coarse grind that you'd use for a percolator and a lot of people have moved away from using percolators these days, but I think all of us can remember those great big um, you know, three, four, five liter percolators from uh, large social functions. This is the coarsest grind. This is the grind that we would use for French press, and you may be familiar with the toddy method, the um, cold brewing method. You want that to be super coarse. All right, why do we have different grinds, different amounts of surface area? How does that impact the cup of coffee? Well, in the case of Turkish, that's the only anomaly to the rest of the coffees. It's all about saturation time, the amount of time that the water is combined with the coffee. Espresso, if done properly, water passes through those grounds in about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Doing a pour over or a cone filter might take a couple of minutes a basket filter a little bit longer, a percolator maybe a half an hour. Toddy, when you make toddy on the counter, it's a 12 to 14, 15 hour process where you're soaking those grounds. So the course of the grind, the longer they can sit exposed to the water and not get bitter or astringent or sour tastes. The reason I say that Turkish is a little bit different is that you actually consume a lot of the grounds. It's boiled with the water at the same time, a little bit of sugar, and it creates a very uniquely Mid Middle Eastern tasting cup of coffee. And it's pretty spectacular, but it's got a real musky, earthy taste to it that other forms, other brewing methods wouldn't have. If you think about the coffee bean as, say, El Capitan or um, a, a mountain, these would be giant boulders. The surface area is the equivalent of a giant boulder. We look at the Turkish and you say, gosh, this is a tablespoon of coffee. This is also a tablespoon of coffee. What's the difference? How, how can they look so different? This has 10,000 times the surface area exposed than that. This is the equivalent of dust. It's like dust on the beach. And these are like boulders. And then we have varying grades of sand and small rock gravel, and then slightly larger rocks in between. But you put the same amount of water in that as you put in this, this you're going to be chewing. 
and this you're going to say, wow, what a weak cup of coffee. Um, so let's take a look at brewing up some of this coffee. Okay, Dave. It's not even salt to taste. Tell me what you're doing. <laughs> I'm adding espresso ground coffee to a... Um, to a stovetop espresso maker. These are very popular makers in Italy. Um, you can use them anywhere that you have a heat source as opposed to the big fancy espresso machines that everyone loves to have now that require a lot of electricity. This will get you a very nice cup of coffee without, um, without electricity. What's going on, and I'll take this thing apart and show you quickly. Under this filter, have the water. You put in cold water and you set the filter with the, uh, with the coffee ground in it. Screw down the top and you put that on your stove top and you literally bring it to a boil and the coffee will rise up through the center tube and I can't really tilt this because of the water in the bottom of the canister but the coffee will rise up and pour into here and as it fills this pitcher or this pot rather, then we'll have a nice cup of espresso. And is there any advantage or uh, any benefit to using one coffee type or uh, versus another coffee type? Because we talk about the different roasts, the medium, the dark, the espresso roast, and I know the dark is obviously darker than the medium. And, and the espresso is the darkest, why would someone go with a espresso roast for an espresso machine, or does one have to? You don't have to. I actually prefer medium roasted coffee in my espresso. Um, however, traditionally, well, okay, let's back up a second. Espresso is a drink. Espresso is a roast. And espresso is a blend. Um, usually espresso, Italian espresso, is a blend of African and Asian beans. Uh, espresso roast is one of the darker roasts. It's darker than a dark roast, um, darker than a French, darker than an Italian, lighter than a Spanish. Um, the reason that it's roasted so dark is to extract uh, the oils, or express the oils rather. Because, as I was saying earlier, you're going to make an espresso in a very short period of time. The grounds aren't going to be exposed to the water for very long. You want to have as much of that surface area as, uh, available as possible and as much of the oil available because that's what you're going to be drinking, the essential coffee oils plus a little bit of the particulates that cause it to be brown plus the water that you've added. Um, What's the advantage of the oils? Well, the oils are where all the flavor is. It's just like fat and, and meat or in vegetables. That's where the flavor resides. Okay. Um, and like I say, I like a medium roasted espresso. I don't have to have that super dark. Um, a lot of people, particularly in Italy, really like a bitterness to some of their foods. They like radicchio and uh, campari and a couple of different things that I can think of off the top of my head that have a bitter taste to them. They like their espressos to be bittersweet. They, they like their chocolate to be bittersweet as well. Um, it's just a flavor preference. And since that's where it developed, that's what the traditional espresso would have. So a slight bitterness and astringency to it. Um, sometimes you'll go to a restaurant, you'll see that cut with a little piece of lime rind. And the oil from the lime will offset some of the other flavors and, and uh, balance things out nicely. Adds a little bit of a sweetness to it. Um, in terms of uh, drip grinds, the cone versus the uh, the cone or the pour over versus the basket, those are traditionally done because the manufacturers of all of these countertop machines that we now have, um, they've engineered their machines to mix the grounds with a certain temperature of water for a certain amount of time. The cone shaped filter can handle a finer grind because, in addition, to all the other parameters, gravity is helping feed the water down the funnel shape faster than if it were a basket shape. The water will 
rest in that basket for a lot longer, setting in the ground for a lot longer. Hence the larger grind, because they're going to be mixed for, for longer. If you used a finer grind in a Mr. Coffee, for example, you're almost bound to get a really astringent, bitter cup, because the engineers didn't design it for variation. They designed it for it to be the same, for it to be the same every single time. Um, with the cone filter, I have to pay attention to what's going on on the stove. Um, with the cone filter, it's just a couple of minutes. With the basket filter, it's going to be more than double that. Um, with regard to uh, the largest grind that we have uh, on display today, and we're going to be using with the French press, the reason that we want that to be so coarse is that we're going to show you how to make a nice French press, but you leave the grounds and the hot water together for four minutes before you press it down and, and drink it. Four minutes is kind of a long time for it to set together like that um, with no filter and you want to express those oils so that it sits a little bit longer in there. Um, this other brewing method that I'm going to show today is called a Chemex. And a Chemex um, is basically a modified pour over. You use these fancy filters um, that you pre-wet so that you don't have a whole lot of the water and coffee ending up in the filter. And then you pour the hot water in there, it goes through and filters into the carafe. This is the, t the stovetop espresso. It looks pretty thick. And it is pretty thick. Molto bene. And how does it smell, Dave? Mmm. Like Tuscany during the grape harvest. Well, that actually probably smells fermented, doesn't it? You would know. You've been there. I have. You know, this smells like Andrea Bocelli's voice sounds. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. Very yeah. similar. That looks like So what are you pouring this time, Dave? This is that Middle Eastern Turkish style coffee. You can see it looks a little more like hot cocoa. It's really, it's thicker. In the espresso because there's ground coffee in that. That so is quite a difference. I have a, a thicker body. Ooh, I can smell that from over here. Yeah, this one that really does smell. Some intense stuff. Is All that right. still raw? Does it, how do how do the ground stay in that versus if you just do an espresso? Cook it on the oh, stove. you did. Better okay. Like, yeah, you do. You just cook them all the same. How long does things. that does that steep or cook? You bring it to a boil. You throw the grounds, the water, cold water, the grounds, and sugar, and then you bring it to a boil. And cowboy coffee. Yeah, it's cowboy. that's what it, it is. is cowboy, cowboy, coffee. cowboy coffee. Except that cowboy coffee traditionally was fined with egg white or egg shells. Oh, that's right. And they would they would grind up the eggshells and throw them in there and stir, the creative vortex throw them in there and it would take the grounds down. Yeah, the egg white the egg white does. Yeah. Wow. Arabica beans are flavor beans? Yeah. Meaning those are the ones Those are the better flavored beans. It's like with cacao, uh -huh. there's Criollo and there's Forastero. And then there's the blend of the two called Trinitario. Hmm. And they're... Wow, interesting. I like that. I like yeah. sweet coffee. That's good. It's like... I hate sweet coffee and I think that that's pretty tasty. Yeah. Well, the, the sugar, my guess is that it's somewhat caramelized because... Would it caramelize it? Does it get I don't know. Out? I don't know. It would bond with the coffee grounds, though, so that the molecule gets even bigger. Mm -hmm. so yeah, the it's good. particle gets bigger. I... The, the Turkish coffee that I've had in the past... Yeah. ...was not that sweet. Yeah, not, neither was mine. You taste this while it's still stirred. Okay. And you'll get a mouthful of grounds. And, it's and still, that's what and you're it, supposed to and get? And it's still good. Yeah. <laughs> So with the French press method, you put coarsely ground, super coarsely ground coffee in the carafe and sometimes people say, give everything a stir. 
in my opinion, I, I just I don't agree with that. Um, I use the action of the water going in. I create a little circular vortex with the water as I'm pouring it in, just off a of boil, and I let that mix the grounds up. And the reason for that is multifold. If you were to hit the glass with a metal spoon, you might break the glass. Also, the oils, which are where all the flavor is, <clears throat> tend to cling to the spoon. If you use a non-metal, you might be a little bit better off, but it'd have to be a non-metal porous, or non-metal, non-porous spoon. I mean, it's, it's just, just use the water and, and put it in a vortex. Um, this is a really small, um, a really small French press. They have ones that are actually quite large that can do up to 32 cups of coffee at one time. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's huge. I, you have to be a strong man just to lift it. Um, one of the first things that you can notice is how much lighter and more translucent it is than the espresso and the Turkish. And that's just because that's a normal, a normal grind. And through the magic of television... <clears throat> so at the end of four minutes, you plunge down the filter. It filters the grounds all the way to the bottom of the carafe. And you're ready to go. Pour in a cup of coffee. To many people around the world, the French press is the single best tasting cup of coffee possible. That's the preferred method, and they would take that over any other. Very different smell. Same exact coffee, ground differently, and yet completely different aroma than you get from the other two methods thus far. Very hot, but nice cup of coffee. With a pour over, like the Melita Perfect Cup, you want to pour a little bit of water in Get the grounds wet, let them degas, which is to say that it'll foam up and bubble. It's just making sure that all the grounds get moistened first, and then slowly add in the rest of the, of the hot water. Again, just off boil, you don't ever want to put boiling water with your coffee. With the exception of Turkish, you wouldn't ever put boiling water with your coffee grounds. It strips the oils too fast, and it ends up um, soaking a lot of the, the bitter tasting elements very quickly and putting them into your cup. So you can see what's happening there. It's just dripping through, making kind of a mess doing that, but dripping through into the cup from above. So how long would you let a kettle sit after it whistles before you would pour? Um, Oh, just a, a matter of seconds. Oh, okay. just, just let it let it go, because boil is what, 215? You want it to be about 195. Degrees? Yeah. Okay. So not long at all. The temperature drops pretty dramatically. But how long does this take to filter through? Um, it depends on how much coffee is being used, how much water is being used, but um, generally speaking, it's one to two minutes. It's a pretty fast stricture. Okay. If you find that it's taking way too long, if it's just sitting there and it's not going down through the filter, um, it's not able to permeate through the filter, then you've got coffee that's ground too fine for that brewing method. And that's true for any brewing method with the exception of Turkish. If, if the time is off and how long it's taking to brew, the first thing you should look at is increasing the size of your grind. Okay, so the water has uh, has passed through all of the coffee grounds and the filter and then passed down into our cup. So we know that this one's done. And here we have what's known as the traditional pour over. This is the same thing that's happening in, say, a Cuisinart or a Krups maker. Um, it's just happening a little bit faster and you can do it on a smaller scale. 
this is actually one of my favorite ways to have coffee, and it's easier than the French press, less to clean up. And this is how I make my morning cup every morning. So here we have a pour over, the traditional French press, Turkish, and an espresso. Okay. Well, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um. It's a lot of coffee. <laughs> so, as I said, we had the six different grinds and uh, we used four different methods for making coffee today, and the others uh, you can make easily uh, at your uh, leisure. Talk about the uh, cold brew a little bit. Cold brew. Cold brewing. It's a method that was developed up in Canada by some medical students who had patients that had acid reflux but still liked coffee. And they were trying to come up with possible brewing methods that would allow these folks to still have their morning cup of coffee without getting that violent acid reflux reaction that's so uncomfortable. Um, after trying a multitude of different um, grinds, brewing temperatures, all sorts of different things, what they found was that if they used very coarsely ground coffee and room temperature to even slightly cool water and then let that water set, with the grounds all mixed up and, and not stir it, but just very gently layer it, basically. Allow the water action to churn the bean or the, the grounds as they added them. And let it sit on the countertop for anywhere from 12 to 20 hours. They got a triple strength coffee extract that they could then drink as an iced coffee or heat up with, um, because it was three to one, they could heat it up with hot water and make the cup of coffee um, a warm version, or they could put it in the microwave or put it in a, a saucepan on the, on the stove top, what have you. It also uh, turned out to be a great ingredient in a lot of things, so people use it in cooking a lot. Um, it pairs particularly well with chocolate, so things like chocolate cake and brownies. Um, you can use it as tiramisu instead of using espresso, just use the triple strength cold brew. It makes a great tiramisu. Um, add a little bit to whipped cream. It makes a really incredible coffee flavored whipped cream. And it is also the bomb in making um, coffee flavored ice cream. You use mm -hmm. that triple strength extract, very low acid, very smooth, caramely cocoa taste. Add that to some half and half or some whipping cream and milk and uh, put it in your ice cream maker. Makes an amazing, amazing uh, ice cream. We use it in our Java Aloha coffee caramel sauce. And each jar of, each eight ounce jar of our sauce has four ounces of this triple strength extract in it. So it's the equivalent of 12 cups of coffee in an eight ounce jar. And people really like it. Um, I, you know, I don't know exactly what chemically is going on that stops that, um, the compounds from coming out, but what those medical students discovered was that those are only released when the grounds are exposed to hot temperatures and water. And then it's extracted and it stays with your cup. If you don't ever heat them up together, the grounds and the water, those compounds remain on the seat. They're in the grounds. Cold brew can be used to uh, mellow out acidic coffees and, and harsher tastes out of coffee for sure. If you open a bag of coffee that you got somewhere or got as a gift and you find that you just really don't like the way it tastes when you brew it up in your favorite brewing method, if you try to cold brew it, it might mitigate enough of those off flavors that aren't so pleasant for you to make it something that you can still use so that you're not wasting it. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, I guess, is is things that you can use uh, spent coffee grounds for. Um, it's funny, we talk about ground coffee, that means it hasn't been brewed, and coffee ground, those have been used. Um, I wouldn't put ground coffee on the ground, but I would put spent grounds in my compost or on the ground in your garden. Um, they add a lot of uh, cellulose, a lot of organic matter. Worms, red worms in particular, love them. They aerate the soil and they absorb moisture so they retain the moisture. If you're in a dry area and you put your spent coffee grounds around a plant, every time you water those grounds absorb some of the moisture and hang on to it a little bit longer than the surrounding soil and that releases a little bit slower and keeps your plant happier 
um, and less thirsty longer. Um, but they, they make for a great natural, um, I don't want to say insecticide, but ants don't like coffee grounds. So if you have a problem with ants or aphids on, say, citrus trees or roses or what have you, if you sprinkle coffee grounds, and I say sprinkle, if you pour them around there, you've got to use quite a bit of coffee grounds, the ants will go away because they don't want to have to dig through that. They really don't care for it. Um, Acid-loving plants really like coffee grounds as well. So if in the tropics, for example, we grow pineapple, pineapple thrives on, on uh, coffee grounds. Up in the north, um, what people use, uh, or what they grow rather, that loves acid, are blueberries. So I know lots of people who take coffee grounds and sprinkle them all around their blueberry bushes. And what ends up happening is their blueberry bushes um, like that additional acid in the soil. They tend to thrive. Their roots go a little bit deeper and, um, and they flower more often. So those are some uses for the coffee grounds. Um, you can use it as an air freshener. Um, it can get a little messy if you're not careful, but for instance, if you've recently painted a room in your house and you take some old newspapers, maybe a, a plastic bag, and you dump a bunch of wet grounds either on that plastic bag or on a bowl on top of the newspaper in the center of the room, wait a day or two if you can, um, and the, the coffee grounds will absorb those smells. You may have noticed when you're flying on airlines, Sometimes the flight attendants will hang a bag of coffee from the uh, little coat hook in the lavatory. It's a great uh, smell absorber and air freshener, and they'll do that quite often um, in small bathrooms and places like ships and airports, uh, ships, airplanes, and trains. So you can try that one at home too. Uh, I know there are lots of spas around the world now using um, coffee grounds as facial scrubs and foot scrubs. The caffeine is still present, even though you've extracted a lot of it in the, in the drink that you just consumed. You can use the coffee grounds as a scrub, and the caffeine invigorates the soil, as does the scrubbing action with the slight abrasive. Um, so you can exfoliate and, and get, I guess, some benefits from the caffeine going sub, sub Q, subdermal. So this is Jim with Through Jim's Eyes, and with our special guest star, the Javananda. <laughs> with uh, David Steiner of Jabaloha Coffee and White Mountain Coffee Company. Aloha. See you next time. Aloha. Javananda. <laughs> this is the end of the Turkish uh, coffee. These are the grounds. Can you read the Turkish coffee grounds? I can. But first I must <laughs> <laughs> anoint you. <laughs> it says there's a lot of butt in your face. <laughs> but what do you mean? Oh! <laughs> your future is filled with butt. <laughs> if you go to Island Girl Eats, you'll find Jill. She's just this amazing woman yeah. that, what all do you do? Well, let's see, I cook, I clean, oh, you mean what do I do for real? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> I cook, I develop menus, uh, I teach cooking classes, I do farmer's market tours, uh, private chef work, and some catering. There you go. So check out Island Girl Eats and you'll find Jill. She and rocks. food, and food, yeah. yeah.